But I do want to touch on water, okay? Water is my long form or now I guess middle to long form deep examination of some things about martial arts, you know, a style or an approach or a mindset or a technical thing or, or you know, different aspects. When, when um, Conor McGregor was going to fight Floyd Mayweather and uh, I approached it like it is possible to win, However, that possibility is, it is possible. Um, and I still believe that the impossible is not, it, there's no such thing as impossible. It's only some amount of barely possible. But once you take the, the idea that something is possible, because it is, everything is possible, just very slim possibilities often, and you start to explore, well, if it's possible, how do you do it? And then you start to explore, and we spent six hours exploring different things, science-based things, ideas of how this could be possible. And in the end, the man lost um, and got worse as the night went on. Um, but the journey of examining that has forever made me a better thinker. And uh, it also led to this series because after that, People, smaller-minded folks than you. Uh, disruption! Black disruption! You know, it's like they were unwilling to think or explore or say what if or how or why or, or what is possible or what if I believe? What could I learn? You know, there's so much there to explore in these things. And so um, – what I broke through to was realizing after that exploration, that deep study, and a lot of deep study is there. Sometimes there are people who, in particular sciences, dedicate their life to something that after 30 or 40 years gets disproven. And that must be really disheartening. But then they also understand that as part of their contribution to that arm of physics or chemistry or you know, biology or whatever, was to do the hard work to disprove something. And that value helps direct the learning to what you can prove or you can study or you can learn. By disproving things, by dedicating 20, 30, 40 years of your life to one phys physics or chemistry theorem or whatever, only to find that it was untrue, that is a valuable use of life. It is. And so by exploring these things deeply sometimes, they open up all kinds of other things. It's hard. It's labor. It's labor intensive. It's exhausting. And sometimes it's unfulfilling. But they take, it takes you places. Um, and so water started when I realized, and I'm not alone on this, and I, I have these conversations. These are the nerdy conversations you get to have when you're at a fight thing and Faraz is there or Duke Rufus is there or Mark Henry or any of these guys who spend their entire lives, John Danaher, or, you know, when you get to speak to these guys and you get to nerd out a little bit, they see, everybody sees who is on this level of, of exploration that there's a decentralization happening in martial arts where it used to be we all said this is how to do it you got to be more like george st pierre we got to train this exact way we've got to get this exact position this is the correct choice always do this never do this all of those structures um are becoming decentralized and by exploring the possibilities of one area it allows you to see it and so when you see tony ferguson he doesn't look anything like george st pierre anything. When you see Stephen Thompson, he doesn't look anything like Johnny Hendricks. And that seems normal now. But when we went through that period, that sort of 2.0 to 3.0 period where everybody was putting together the exact same game and then fighting small battles to see who could win positions, now you have this decentralized thing. And uh, if you go back and you were to to be interested to put in in YouTube after you watch this, Robin Black, Greg Jackson, Cub Swanson versus Ch uh, Choi or something like that. Greg Jackson and I are talking backstage after Cub Swanson and Duho Choi, and that is going on two years ago now. I think, hey eh, Mark, is that two or three? It could be three in December, but it's for sure. Yeah. Cause I'm yeah. 
Yeah, it was the it was a December, probably going to be two years, but it could be three now. That's how far ahead Greg was, and he was talking about how you decentralize the system. That the key to why his and he had a great night. He had Cowboy Knockout, Matt Brown. He had Cub Swanson have this brilliant genius of a fight, and he had other stuff that night. And he was saying that decentralization was the key to where his team was going, to thinking differently, studying differently, playing to each character, to each person and their character and their attributes and everything. So, so water has taken us down that road to look at some of these decentralized ideas and realize that the doctrines of martial arts and Bruce Lee talked about this, that there are these doctrines, you must be in a horse stance and then you must do this. And those were wrong. Uh, they're, they were wrong because they believed they were the way. And there's no the way. There are many ways. And so water allows us to look there. And so I'm only recapping it today in hopes that the general idea of discussion uh, gives you some kind of value. Um, we'll talk about it much more with each episode. I'm going to find a different topic for each episode of Enjoy the Hostilities. But the, what I wanted to touch on today was bare knuckle boxing. I probably spend less time on it than I spent on the big picture of what we look at and why we're looking at it, but uh, but I think that's okay. I hope you forgive me and I hope you got value out of the big picture. But bare knuckle boxing, I've enjoyed a great deal. I commentated uh, a number of the shows and I've broken down. I've got another one I want to do. Jimmy Sweeney, he's the king of bare knuckle. Uh, he's in, from an Irish traveler family, and uh, he is he and his family, his bro his brother, cousin, you know, uh, they've. Um, father, they've all, his family was bare knuckle champions that he's descended from this. And uh, when you watch it, there are people who have seen it that they connect only to the fact that it's rugged and tough. And it's rugged and tough. There's no question. But there's, it's fascinating in so many ways. Um, the, not the least of which, so... Again, I'm, I'm going to go big picture here, but everything you change changes everything, right? Uh, if I say you're not allowed to kick, well, that doesn't just mean I can't kick anymore. It changes the way you stand. It changes the way you move. It changes the way what you cover. It changes the distance you strike at. It changes the safe positions and the dangerous positions. If we only kick for a while, it changes everything too. We fight outside, we, we tangle in different ways. I commentated Taekwondo, and you can punch in Taekwondo, but they stopped doing it because it didn't give you as many points, and it wasn't it didn't celebrate the tradition of Taekwondo, so they moved further and further away from it. And when I commentated the Pan American Games in Taekwondo, the, the uh, sorry, I just got a little bit of a little pain there. I, I was... Um, working out at Bang Fitness today, and it's just a little sore at the insertion. But uh, uh, so they would mostly kick. You can punch, but you got one point for it. There were, you know, it was a whole different thing. So people got away from it. And then the Mexican team just punched everybody in the body and won everything. Because not because they were better at punching, but because they got, the others got worse at dealing with punches because their training partners ever did it and they never did it and they never strategically did it. So it changed everything. The context all changes. And why is this big picture part of it interesting? Because it allows you to see that these things that we fixate on, you know, it's like who's got better distance management? you know, for example. Uh, well, that only matters in particular contexts because if you get more tired, it's different. If you're moving faster, it's different. If you're more aggressive, it's different. If you got, you know, uh, you lean more towards striking with the hands, it's different than the feet. It's about goals, right? And bare knuckle is one of these ones where just taking off the gloves changes so many things, so many things. Um, when you look at the hand, right? So a glove serves a lot of purposes, but its primary purpose is to protect the hands. You know, if you look at old boxing and bare knuckle boxing, which once was just boxing, we called it boxing, we punched each other with our fists. Later, boxing took on gloves. Now, bare knuckle people call that gloved boxing, um, but it protected the hands. Now, great, my hands are now protected, but it changed a lot of things. Now, through the protection of my hands, my weapon has grown in size. It's easier or at least different for me to block a large weapon than it is for me to block a small weapon. 
So now that we've removed the glove, if I've trained my whole lifetime where this would block a glove, well, a fist fits through here. A, an ungloved bare knuckle fist fit, fits through there. So it changes. Knock it over my coffee. So it changes my defensive games. Also, parrying becomes much more important because I can catch that little hand. I can visually see it and track it and use my attention and focus and parry it. Parrying it lets me strike differently, but it also takes my hand away from my, my chin. It, with glove boxing, I might catch that. With bare knuckle boxing, I might parry that. Notice with this parry now, your feint becomes much more effective because your feint, before you would faint, you would faint and I, if I was planning to just catch it off me or block it, your feint would get me to do something or flinch, different response. But if your feint is getting me to parry, you've now opened a giant path for all of your weapons. So all of a sudden, it isn't just, well, I'm not wearing gloves. Now, I, we're not wearing gloves, which means I, it's harder for me to block, which means I often try to parry, which means your feint causes a bigger reaction, which means your feint results in my bigger reaction, which opens more lines for you, which means you're throwing more, which means if I'm also slipping, I'm putting the whole game changes. The whole game changes. So, and that, one, I love this sport. I love commentating bare knuckle boxing. I love it. I love the fighting. I love these things I'm describing to you, these detailed changes of how it changes. I love the heart and the courage. I love the tradition because fighting has a variety of traditions. UFC or MMA or uh, Valley Tudo or free fighting hasn't been around in its modern form that long, but it has traditions and culture. Well, this is hundreds of years older it travels back and it carries with it certain beliefs and attitudes and conflicts. There are families that have hated each other for 10 generations that fight. You talk. It's a good movie to watch yeah. for the fans. Knuckle. Knuckle. Yeah, it's amazing. So it was on Netflix. It may be gone, but you can find it. It's called Knuckle. And it follows the Irish traveler families for generations. And one guy who was so interested in it was building a documentary. He was with them for 8, 10, 12 years. So it's a brilliant documentary. But yeah, you think, it, you know, uh, Jake Shields fought a guy, somebody he fought. He fought his son on the weekend and the son knocked him out, I believe, or finished him. Uh, I didn't see the fight, but the son of the man he had fought, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the son and defeated Jake. Um, I mean, that's a cool story, bro. But what if it was like your great-great-grandfather fought this guy for two and a half hours because they would fight for a long time. So we're going to add other layers of what changes. So we go and we fight you, and, you know, uh, the terms people like to use, there are millions of ways, millions of different ways we can describe the way that Nick or Nate Diaz fights. Uh, millions, and we should explore those because language helps us think differently, right? But for the purpose now, um, you know, he's a volume puncher. That's one people like to say. Uh, it's not the only one, so please don't get stuck on that or, or it'll lose its meaning to you and you won't explore the different aspects of what that can mean. Uh, but that came from, I believe, Jimmy Smith. may come from any number, but I remember Jimmy Smith talking about that term 10 years ago. Uh, which is why in 10 years, a lot of different sciences and arts, they develop new terminologies. They don't just use the one from a decade earlier. By exploring language, we explore thought. But So let's call Nick Diaz or Nate Diaz a volume puncher. Well, if every time they hit, their hands hurt, their whole game would change. So those old fights that would last two hours, sometimes they would just be so sore they had to, and so tired that they had to circle around each other, neither one willing to give, and they became these long you know, endurance sports as well. The greatest fighters in the world in bare knuckle to me that do fight in you know, MMA, which is what we discuss most often here, would be the Diaz brothers or, or Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping would be a pretty great bare knuckle boxer. Yeah, Connor would be, well, but fatigue is an issue, although he's, you know, he understands that and works to improve it. But Nate or Nick Diaz, they could fight for two hours, you know, and they don't hit, they don't hit overly hard. Also, Nick Diaz, so this is a bare knuckle uh, technique as well. Old one, it's been around forever. We're fighting, I'm trying to parry and stuff, and a, and a punch gets through, I take it off the top of my head. Hurts, but it hurts you more. 
my hand smashing against the bone of the top of your head. Your, it, 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 your brain doesn't jar down that way as much as it jars to the side. We'll get some bruises up there, but you know, our neck is trained. We're going to take it. So, but it's going to smash up your hand and wrist. So, and, and Nick still does this to this day. And Nate too, but I'm picturing Nick doing it now. Nick Diaz takes those shots off the top of his head. Uh, it's a beautiful sport. Tradition, culture, attitude. You know, um, these two guys, this guy got into it with Goran Relic, uh, who is a friend of mine. I'm a big fan of his work. I studied him for a long time. And uh, this guy came from the world of glove boxing and started pushing Goran, and they kind of got all lit up. And this guy, gentleman who had uh, was an old uh, boxer, great boxer. I forget his name. My apologies. Um, he fought Lennox Lewis coming up as a kid, and he loves bare knuckle. And he separates them, and he starts yelling. And everybody kind of pauses, and he's like, "This is a gentleman sport. This you are gentlemen." And he's fucking freaking out. And the whole room kind of went silent. And he's, "You shake hands right now." You know, like little kids, I'm sorry. It, and, but that's an aspect to it. These are gentlemen. These are gentlemen in gentlemen's combat with two fists, their skills, their heart, and their guts. No, and the craziest, and I'm actually, kudos to Jim and the whole team at, at BKB and, and any other. There are other bare-knuckle organizations. I'm not as informed about them. I don't want to just, you know, try to slag them off because they're not the ones I work at. I'm sure there are some great ones in the world. It's becoming a popular sport. But BKB, where I work, is uh, something very special. So I, that I can speak to. But Jim and the team, the amount of tweets or people who pop up and say, hey, they're wearing wraps. It's like you wrap four of the 14 knuckles. And uh, it's just support. It's not padding. It's just there to support, and, and uh, it probably helps prevent some cuts. And it's just done. Um, it may help with some solidifying of the hand. It may not. But it may prevent some cuts, but essentially it does nothing. But if and when you watch Bare Knuckle Boxing, whether that's BKB or one of these other ones that I don't yet know much about, uh, but I will, I will, and I will keep an open mind, um, is... Uh, don't just comment and say, oh, they're, they're not bare knuckle, they're wrapped. It's like, it's more tradition than anything. It's just part of it. It's, anyways, that's besides the point. So, but uh, bare knuckle boxing, pretty cool. I'm going to be back. There's one um, July 21st in Wales. I'm not going to travel over for that, but I might may add commentary after the fact. But then in September, early September, uh, it'll be back in London at the O2 Arena. I will definitely be there in London. It just occurs to me maybe the day before, I'll try to see if I can uh, do my one-man show in London. There's a small venue in, in Camden that a friend of mine, uh, I think Graham has a contact there, so maybe I'll check into that. Anyways, but uh, Bare Knuckle Boxing, we will examine it further before that Bare Knuckle Boxing 13 in London when I go look into that. But one... It's a beautiful sport. It's very interesting. We'll look more at it. But two, I wanted to use it as an example, not just it specifically, but in general. Every time you change a rule or a strategy or an attribute or an equipment size or a, or a playing surface or rounds or time, you change anything and it changes everything. Um, maybe that's a topic for another water. You know, no time limits or or wide open spaces. Joe, uh, on one of his fight companions, we brought that up. Something he's talked about many times. Brendan asked me about it on his podcast too. No time limits, no constrictions. Think of it. It changes everything.